Welcome everyone to today's webinar with German ambassador to the United States, Emily Haber. Here is Dan Mary Ashen, CEO of Benebrith International. Hello everyone and welcome to today's conversation with Benebrith. I'm Dan Mary Ashen, CEO of Benebrith International. Thanks to you all for joining us today. Today's webinar will focus on the simultaneous German presidencies of the European Union Council and the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or IRA, as it is known, on US-German relations, the state of transatlantic relations, Germany's role in combating anti-Semitism, and other issues. With me to help address these issues and more is Emily Haber, Germany's ambassador to the United States. Ambassador Haber has served as Germany's top diplomat to the US since 2018. She is a career foreign service officer having served in Moscow, Ankara, and the Balkans. She's held various leadership positions in the Federal Foreign Office in Berlin, including Director of the OSCE Division and Commissioner for Conflict Prevention and Crisis Management. Ambassador Haber also was the first woman to hold the position of State Secretary. And prior to becoming Ambassador, she served as State Secretary of the Federal Ministry of the Interior. Madam Ambassador, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, our first question uh, has to do with the German EU presidency. Uh, German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas has declared that Germany's EU Council presidency will be the coronavirus presidency. How will Germany use its position to lead uh, Europe's continuing response uh, to the pandemic? Uh, what are some of the other priorities uh, for the EU over the next six months? And uh, perhaps first, you can tell us a little about what the presidency is and what it entails. Thank you. Yes, I will. Um, I find when talking to Americans, uh, they have a very vague idea of what actually the presidency entails and what the EU uh, um, presidency means. Uh, you see, the EU is all about teamwork. Uh, the representatives of countries are sitting around the table and uh, are negotiating uh, uh, compromises. It's not an abstract body. It's not an abstract uh, uh, bureaucracy. It's uh, um, a negotiation framework. In, during the time of the Lisbon Treaty, we discussed actually whether to abolish uh, uh, the uh, presidency and whether to give the leadership uh, into the hand of the Brussels uh, organizations. Um, the decision was taken not to. Uh, it will be still the, there's still a presidency of the council, uh, which is rotating every six months uh, and which is uh, determining the agenda and playing a role in, or leading role even, in negotiating uh, outcomes. But this presidency is somewhat different. Uh, we had to jettison uh, all our, or not, but nearly all our plans uh, that we had prepared over the past year uh, with a view to 1st of July, simply because of the multiple crisis uh, that we are going through right now. So now the presidency will be much about uh, 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 handling the corona crisis, uh, handling the rebound, uh, uh, and making, uh, well, leading the EU uh, recovery, that would be center uh, stage. And we've, um, because this crisis is so ex extraordinary and existential, uh, existential, we've just assumed a lot of orthodoxies uh, uh, that were informing uh, our positions uh, um, to date. It is often the case uh, that um, a huge crisis or shocks uh, will open up space for change. And you see that uh, in the way we're handling uh, the recovery, no one would have imagined uh, a couple of months ago uh, that we would see uh, a discussion uh, uh, um, about the commission raising money at interna on international financial markets, on handing out not only credit credits, but also grants, uh, a discussion about the mutualization uh, of debt with actually Germany along with France uh, leading uh, into that direction. That was unthinkable before, but that's where we are now. Uh, this goes beyond uh, the uh, recovery uh, plan. We'll be dealing with the uh, multi-annual uh, um, multi uh, financial framework. And all in all, uh, we're speaking about much, much larger sums than we used to in the past. 
used to be something like 1% of the GDP, we're talking now about nearly 2% of the GDP. We'll be uh, focusing uh, on uh, the lessons learned of the crisis as well, and that is how can we prepare for future pandemics? How can we make sure that we have uh, that we have the resilience to face uh, uh, challenges? How can we readapt value chains, uh, uh, alter procurement uh, uh, um, uh, uh, policies, uh, making sure that we have stocks uh, in therapeutics, in vaccines, uh, and so forth? How can we make sure uh, that we have comparable and interoperable uh, uh, prevention uh, uh, plans? Um, beyond that, we want, we want to use uh, what I call the space for change uh, that the shock, the multiple shocks uh, of our crisis presented, and that is to boost uh, digitization, uh, to accelerate uh, uh, the uh, uh, accelerate combating uh, climate change by uh, uh, going much more rapidly towards uh, fossil uh, uh, fossil free uh, fuels uh, than we had originally planned and of course uh, by uh, boosting uh, technological sovereignty. All of that is a lesson of the crisis. Foreign policies issues will be there as well. There will be an EU-China summit, there will be an EU-Africa summit, and last not least, there's Brexit to handle. So you can see uh, it's an extra, these are extraordinary circumstances. We have no time to lose. Usual presidencies, if you don't come to, um, uh, uh, to conclusions uh, or uh, negotiate final outcomes, well, the next presidency uh, can do that. In our case, we can't wait on Brexit. We can't wait on the recovery program. We can't wait with the multi-annual uh, financial framework. It's closely interlinked. So to some extent, we're really doomed to produce outcomes. Yeah, it's a lot to pack in in six months, not only for the German presidency, but for every presidency. And as you say, I mean, in these times, uh, that much more challenging and that much more difficult. Well, let's move on now to um, the state of transatlantic relations. How would you assess the, um, the transatlantic relationship today? Um, if you would also talk as well about US-German relations, uh, and especially uh, in a time of crisis, why are transatlantic relations, good transatlantic relations, uh, so important? It's so important because the world is changing so much and the balance in the world is changing and it's not changing in our favor. Uh, um, that's, that's the framework. Now, usually if when people discuss with me uh, transatlantic relations, they point to differences and they would point to burden sharing or tariffs uh, or um, uh, a North Stream, uh, the gas pipeline between Russia and uh, Germany. They would uh, talk, but these are key issues in any event. But you know, none of them are new. Most of them uh, have a long history, in some cases dating back to the 70s and 80s. And I'll always repeat that we have a lot of experience in hearing each other out, in discussing with each other, in managing disagreement, uh, or in coming to conclusions. So I don't worry so much about that. There's something else uh, I find more worrisome, and that is the chain, that is the opening um, gulf in the way we look at international, at the international architecture of rules and um, compacts and agreements and uh, treaties and institutions. And from um, German, but also European point of view, uh, they are, they may be flawed. Many of them are. Uh, they're not unchangeable. Uh, international, uh, the international landscape changes constantly uh, and along with it, its rules uh, and, the implement, uh, uh, and the implementation of them. But for a country like Germany or for European countries, it's overwhelmingly important uh, that there is a framework in place because it promises us predictability, transparency, and reliability. We need that. We need that because we're not the single most uh, powerful country in the world, uh, and which can expect uh, when it decides, uh, decides to, uh, to uh, rely on self-reliance uh, and to rely on the fact that in asymmetric bilateral uh, circumstances, it will be always more powerful uh, than the interlocutor. We can't do that. Uh, 
Small countries, medium-sized countries can't do that. They need the, uh, the framework. And that's where we start to think in different terms. Uh, and for Europeans, it's, it's existential. It's existential if we want to stand our ground, and defend our values and principles and our capacity to make choices and to, uh, um, to defend uh, who we are. We can't afford to rely on self-reliance. And that is, uh, of course, the rationale of the European Union as well, where we alone without uh, the institution of the European Union, we'd be infinitely uh, weaker and more vulnerable. That's why we decided as Europeans uh, uh, to, um, uh, to rely on the collective cloud uh, uh, of, um, of shared institutions and shared uh, uh, policy making. So that's the difference uh, and that's the di it's a difference which seems to me is existential if, if the gulf uh, will widen and uh, us german relations well um, us german relations are obviously important both for uh, um, nato and eu as well simply because within uh, europe uh, uh, germany arguably uh, is uh, uh, is the largest country and the, the strongest country uh, right now. So if the if there's change or even uh, alienation in the transatlantic rela uh, relationship, the question really is in place uh, how this might spill over into the transatlantic uh, dimension of both uh, EU and NATO, simply because, uh, the, because of the size and the role uh, we play. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't look um, at the transatlantic German-American uh, relationship in a very isolated uh, manner. If you do, uh, you, do not, you do not see uh, the potential impact and ramifications it can have uh, in um, all formats uh, uh, where um, uh, in, in institutions or in organizations uh, where both uh, you play a role and uh, we play a role. Right now, we have a number of differences. Uh, it's true. But as I said at the outset, we also have a lot of experience in dealing with it. And I should say, this should be the spirit. Because at the end of the day, and not only at the end of the day, uh, in principle, the relationship with the United States for my country is the single most important bilateral relationship we have outside of the European Union. In many terms, in security terms, in economic terms, in politics terms, policy terms, and uh, in one context uh, that these days uh, isn't mentioned uh, ever so often, although it should. If it's about what we want to be, about values, about principles, about the capacity to make choices, about rule of law, well, who have we to look in this world to, towards, uh, uh, if not towards the uh, United States? All of that makes it a, cr a crucial and uh, existentially important relationship. I want to move now to a discussion about anti-Semitism. Uh, our paths crossed actually in 2004 uh, when you were heading the OSCE, Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe Division, uh, at uh, the German Foreign Office, and Germany organized, hosted, uh, perhaps the most important conference um, on anti-Semitism, global conference on anti-Semitism. Uh, I was a, a public member of the US delegation at that time, and um, then Secretary of State uh, Colin Powell uh, gave a, an extremely important speech at that conference because it was, it was then that the, the issue of anti-Israelism and anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism uh, was just beginning to be recognized. And, and Powell gave an important speech um, uh, at that time where he said, well, legitimate criticism of Israel is one thing, but it crosses the line mm -hmm. uh, when um, Israelis are cast uh, as, as Nazis or as Israel is an apartheid state, um, uh, et cetera. So uh, it was a, a really a landmark uh, conference. Now, to bring it current, uh, Germany has banned two anti-Semitic neo-Nazi groups this year. Uh, but the past year has also seen, um, according to one report, a 13% increase in attacks 
against Jewish individuals and institutions, including uh, a deadly attack on the synagogue in Halle uh, last uh, Yom Kippur. Um, and demonstrations against uh, the German government's COVID-19 containment measures uh, have also featured anti-Semitic uh, sentiments. What do the recent events tell you about the need to combat anti-Semitism and what more remains to be done? Um, all the figures you've given uh, are correct. There was a 30% increase um, of uh, incidents and especially uh, the attack in Halle uh, uh, was deeply uh, shocking and distressing uh, um, for my country. Um, I think the lessons to be learned is uh, if you want to uh, combat anti-Semitism, you need a multi-pronged approach. You need a multi-pronged approach, which also takes into account the changing face of anti-Semitism, because they have very different, as we already discussed in 2004 at the conference, uh, anti-Semitism nowadays uh, has changing roots, and they're, they're now changing too. So by multi-pronged approach, uh, I mean, um, it has to encompass uh, um, law enforcement, it has to uh, um, entail a security measure, and it has to focus uh, on education and uh, prevention. Uh, by security measure, I mean or measures. I mean uh, steps, uh, obviously, like uh, making sure uh, that uh, uh, Jewish institutions are uh, um, are uh, 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 secured. Uh, uh, that the federal states are cooperating on that by law enforcement. I mean banning uh, insti uh, uh, banning. Uh, associations uh, uh, or um, uh, uh, publications uh, that are that incite uh, violence uh, and are, um, are hate speech uh, deleting it in the internet I know that's a tricky thing to discuss with Americans but we come from a different uh, place uh, and have adopted a law actually uh, that obliges the providers to go after hate speech uh, and places it into in their responsibility. I mean, by uh, law enforcement, uh, I also mean accelerating uh, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, trials uh, uh, and making sure that uh, that uh, this happens in a very uh, that happens quickly. Uh, we have um, uh, we have set up uh, commissioners um, uh, against anti uh, anti-Semitism in every uh, German federal state. We used to just have one in the uh, in on the federal level, but now the federal states have commissioners as well. Uh, it's part of the policy uh, to raise awareness uh, uh, of uh, uh, of what is going on. We want to make sure uh, uh, that whenever incidents occur. Uh, uh, this will be uh, uh, notified to the police and that we have a central register uh, of uh, these cases. And lastly, uh, we, need to, um, uh, we need to pursue more uh, in terms of education uh, and we have to invest into uh, de-radicalization uh, uh, and prevention programs. Now, having served in the interior ministry and actually having been in charge of uh, uh, a whole range of the issues I mentioned, uh, I tell you that is always incredibly time consuming uh, and is very uh, long term. So while all of that may not be uh, satisfactory, uh, um, it's still, uh, it's important to focus on the many areas where you have to, uh, where you have to proceed at the same time and, and take measures at the same time. Well, the hate on the internet question is um, is one that is vexing all of us, and in fact, uh, one that we're struggling with right here, in the United States right now, uh, with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, et cetera. So this is a um, not only an ongoing battle, but it is a crucial battle uh, in in dealing with this. When we met in '04, um, hate on the internet was there, but the internet was not in its infancy, infancy but it was not where it, it is today. So this is, a, um, this is a major challenge, really, for all of us. Now, Germany uh, currently not only holds the EU Council presidency, but the chairmanship of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, uh, known by its acronym IRA, as well. And as we uh, commemorate the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II this year, we're witnessing an increase in Holocaust revisionism, 
uh, aided by such factors as the growth of anti-Semitism, the rise of far-right populist parties uh, in Europe, such as uh, Alternative for Germany, uh, in, which downplay the Holocaust or question its very history, uh, and not less important, the changing of the generational guard, uh, which has seen many younger leaders come forward in Germany for whom the Holocaust really has faded in history uh, with its lessons less potent today. Uh, do we have the capacity, all of us, do we have the capacity and the resources to reverse this disturbing trend of forgetting and even rewriting history? Mm -hmm. I think it's a very disturbing uh, uh, trend. The other day, uh, some uh, someone in my staff had given uh, me a poll, uh, written to me about a poll in Germany, uh, which said that uh, among the 18 to 20, uh, 34 year olds, about 40% said they knew little or nothing about the Holocaust. I sent that back to him and I said, I don't believe that. Uh, uh, show me the poll, show me the ask, uh, the questions were, uh, uh, what the question asked was, uh, and I want to say the details uh, of it. He sent that to me and uh, the, the poll actually uh, had the shocking, I found, uh, uh, result that I had just quoted. So that makes it obvious. Uh, uh, that education uh, is uh, education and, uh, and awareness is center stage. And as we have taken over uh, the IRA uh, chairmanship in, uh, in March, uh, um, these are our, um, uh, our key priorities. First of all, challenge uh, the denial and the distortion uh, um, of uh, the Holocaust. And by the way, also the genocide of the uh, Roma, we hope, uh, we hope to um, have by the December plenary uh, um, uh, definition uh, on uh, that, uh, which we haven't uh, so far. Our second uh, priority will be fighting anti-Semitism uh, in making sure that the um, definition of anti-Semitism that we have agreed upon uh, in IRA uh, in 2016 uh, is being uh, uh, accepted by more and more countries and actually uh, being acted upon uh, in more and more countries. Uh, uh, and uh, thirdly, uh, on education, the IRA has adopted recommendation for the teaching and learning uh, of the, uh, the Holocaust. Uh, and we want to make sure uh, that this is being uh, implemented uh, and uh, used uh, in, in more and more countries we want to have. Uh, uh, we want to pursue an initiative uh, to push uh, 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 this forward. Yeah, the, uh, the, the IRA definition adoption by a number of countries, and not all the countries have adopted, uh, uh, then this certainly uh, it should that's be. A mission. That's a mission of ours. Yeah, well, this is, <laughs> it should be right at, the top, right at the top of the list. Uh, the IRA definition is, is good, and, and, and it, is, it is important. Of course, it, it's not everything. Uh, but it, it is a baseline. I think it should be, and it's an important baseline because before we didn't, we didn't have this. Um, and um, it was easy for, for governments uh, not to be held accountable because um, what you might consider anti-Semitism, somebody might consider uh, something else. So it's important that, uh, that others um, engage. And uh, the issue of, of Holocaust education, and today, you know, we think of education, we think of students in the school, in a high school, perhaps, or maybe universities offer courses, but um, it has to be for law enforcement. It needs to be for public yeah. officials. I mean, there, there are so many um, aspects of, of what education constitutes. And also, and I hope this will be a part of, of uh, your work over the next six months, um, it's also remembrance. Remembrance is, is part of the, uh, the name of IRA uh, and uh, commemorating. Um, at a time when, uh, unfortunately, particularly among young people, and I don't mean to be flippant, um, uh, you know, history began 15 minutes ago. Um, it, it really is, is important uh, that these things be, be stressed. And particularly under a German uh, chairmanship, uh, really, we're looking forward to, uh, yeah. to progress in that regard.
You know that we've set up a, a task force against uh, Holocaust denial and uh, distortion, uh, which is uh, looking uh, into different strategies in countries. Experts are doing that right now uh, under the leadership of the uh, Elie Wiesel Institute uh, in Romania, uh, Romania and uh, Yad Vashem and the uh, Memorial uh, de la Shoah in France. So yes, uh, it's a key area where we want to see uh, where can we, from whom can we learn, and how can we extend uh, the acceptance and the application uh, of uh, 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 strategies on uh, uh, combating Holocaust denial and distortion. Oh, you mentioned the you mentioned the Wiesel Institute in Romania. Uh, mm -hmm. I was a member of that uh, of the Wiesel Commission, which led to the establishment of the institute. And um, there was a period uh, where um, several countries uh, were, had organized commissions to study the Holocaust in their particular country. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that was done for a while. The Wiesel Report was uh, really was, was quite well done. But that seems to have fallen by the wayside. And that may be another thing perhaps yes. that Germany can encourage in those countries that haven't yet addressed it, that they, they should do it um, as well. Um, well we, I wanted we to. We want to launch a campaign on that, exactly. I want to turn to uh, another important issue, and that's terrorism, but to um, zero in on something very specific. Uh, Germany has joined the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Netherlands uh, this year in banning the terrorist group Hezbollah in its entirety. Um, we say in its entirety because Europe, uh, until fairly recently, uh, was not was was uh, equivocal about Hezbollah with a political wing, military wing. Of course, for Hezbollah, you know, all money is fungible, so it doesn't makes no difference to them. Um, but there was this this unnatural uh, uh, bifurcation. Now, with Hezbollah increasingly using Europe as a launching pad for its terrorist and its criminal activities, raising money, moving money, uh, will the German presidency finally be the moment? when the EU adopts a Europe-wide ban on Hezbollah? As you pointed out, Dan, uh, we have, a, there's a conversation in Europe uh, which factors in uh, different aspects on the uh, Hezbollah. There are those who point, as we did, uh, to uh, the uh, huge threat of Hezbollah, uh, in particular to Israel, uh, to the buildup of Hezbollah weaponry and its malign activities. There are others who point to the stability uh, uh, of uh, Lebanon and to the Lebanon uh, government. Uh, again, others who point uh, to Hezbollah's role, for example, in, um, in Syria. So it's a very complex uh, uh, um, uh, discussion. And one of the reasons why we decided to move forward nationally uh, was uh, that we wanted to alter the dynamics, but it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that this will be, uh, um, it may alter the dynamic of the, uh, um, uh, of the discussion, but the um, uh, concerns that others have, uh, especially with regard to uh, Lebanon, uh, will not uh, uh, fade away and vanish uh, overnight. Now, um, Hezbollah in uh, Germany is not, uh, organized. Uh, we have individuals with um, Hezbollah uh, sympathies, uh, but there were no uh, institutions or associations uh, or organizations uh, that were clearly Hezbollah. If there had been, uh, and they have been in the past, uh, the German government did everything uh, to ban them. I remember in my time in the Interior Ministry, uh, when we banned uh, the orphanage uh, uh, organization, which uh, claimed to be supportive uh, of uh, uh, Lebanese orphans, but uh, was really a, a money-collecting institution uh, for the Hezbollah. It often takes time uh, to ban them because uh, they, will, they will always go to court. We have never lost a case uh, uh, because our case, uh, cases were all, always so watertight uh, that they could stand up in court. So what we had to do now uh, when uh, going after Hezbollah, as we couldn't ban something, we had to ban the activities. We had to make sure uh, that it 
uh, wasn't going to be possible for um, Hezbollah individuals in, when participating in institute uh, in, um, in demonstrations, for example, uh, that they would carry uh, Hezbollah uh, signs and symbols or or would undertake any activities with uh, Hezbollah, uh, which would uh, indicate Hezbollah affiliations. Uh, that's a national step. Uh, it is. Um, uh, it's not apl applicable to um, to other European states. If we move forward towards uh, in the European Union, we would have to uh, uh, focus on uh, listing. But there again, uh, uh, we depend on uh, on consensus. Well, I think there was an, there was an important moment after the um, attack in Burgas, Bulgaria. Uh, by Hezbollah operatives. It was yes. really a, a moment where, where Europe might have acted in concert. I, I would just say one other thing about Lebanon. And I think, I think the, those who uh, advance this argument about the stability of Lebanon are, are, are really giving uh, Hezbollah a pass uh, because essentially Hezbollah has taken over the Lebanese government. Uh, the Lebanese government is, is uh, perhaps sovereign in name only, but in terms of its activities, it, it really is part of uh, really not only Hezbollah, it's part of Iran Inc. Um, so um, I, I think those the Lebanese arguments, uh, 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 I, I, I see where they, they're being brought in, but I think it, it just gives uh, Hezbollah a pass. And I hope that, uh, that the EU uh, will take another look at this. Uh, if there's, there's a way to, to do this, um, message needs to be sent uh, clearly to Hezbollah uh, in terms of its, as you, use the word and word that we use today to describe their activity, which is malign indeed. Uh, one final question, uh, Madam Ambassador, um, Germany's relationship with Israel. Um, the, um, I think of, uh, I'm not sure whether this is the 65th anniversary, 55th, 55th anniversary of the meeting, or close to it, of the meeting of David Ben-Gurion and Conrad Adenauer at the Waldorf uh, in, in New York, uh, or maybe the anniversary actually of the full diplomatic relations of, the, of Germany sending an ambassador, I think it was Rolf Pauls, yes. uh, sending an ambassador to Israel. Um, looking, looking back and looking at where it is today in terms of trade, uh, intelligence sharing, um, mm -hmm. defense cooperation, uh, all of these issues that go into a relationship, a bilateral relationship, would you comment on, on the state of German-Israeli relations today? Our relationship with Israel is um, second to none. It's a template for no other relationship. It's a relationship uh, where the sense that where we are today was possible in spite of it all uh, is still enormous. And we remain that way. It is, as the Chancellor said in the Knesset, uh, um, a couple of years back, uh, the, our sense um, of relationship with Israel is part of what we are. It's part of the German identity. And you can say that about no other relationship that we have. So it is extremely special in ways uh, that um, Embrace the past when looking towards the future. I think that's a way uh, uh, to put it uh, for Germans. Um, it's incredibly uh, uh, close. When I was in the interior ministry, uh, um, I saw it uh, in security terms. I think there is, setting uh, the United States aside, no country uh, um, with which we work as closely uh, on security matters, on domestic security matters, on terrorism, uh, as with Israel. And I remember cases uh, where uh, that had been crucially important uh, in order to ward off uh, uh, terrorist uh, attempts. It's uh, close in, in many other areas. Uh, on, you mentioned trade, uh, you uh, mentioned uh, um, external uh, security. Um, so, even if we may have uh, individual uh, differences, as all countries have, uh, I think the, um, the pervasive sense of both history and future uh, is uh, um, dominant uh, in, uh, in this relationship. And it makes it unique. 
and we're grateful for that. Well, it's an extremely important relationship and um, uh, not only in all of the things that we've discussed in terms of the bilateral relationship, but in terms of what's going on in the world today. And uh, we, uh, we hope, of course, that uh, this relationship will, will continue to solidify and to grow, uh, of course, going forward. Um, Madam Ambassador, we really appreciate your taking the time to speak with us uh, today. I wanna thank you for sharing your views on uh, these issues, which uh, we all share in common. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. And I'm glad to see you again. And I hope to see you soon, uh, actually in flesh and in blood. <laughs> I do too. Well, I wanna thank German Ambassador to the United States, Emily Haber, for being with us today and for such a timely and important conversation, especially at this moment in time. A recording will be available on demand on our YouTube channel shortly. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today and I hope that you will come back for future discussions. Until then, take care, continue to be well. We'll see you again soon. See you soon, bye-bye.